What if I told you that over half of computer science classes are a complete waste of your time? Traditionally, computer science focuses on, well, the study of computers and how they work. But realistically, most of us just don't care about that at all. If you're anything like me, you probably just want to learn how to use computers to build some cool stuff. Now there's of course more practical about computer science than just coding. But realistically, you don't need all of the stuff that academia has defined as being part of computer science. So in this video, I want to share with you all of the practical parts of computer science without the academic fluff. That said, it's still important to understand from a fundamental level how computers work because all of our other knowledge sort of stems from that. So I am going to give you a quick rundown of that, but I will keep it very short. At the core, computers are basically just a bunch of transistors, and transistors are like light switches. They are either on or they are off, and we represent these two states using binary notation, one for on and zero for off. Quick aside here, transistors are made of silicon, so that's where we get the name Silicon Valley. It's literally just a valley with lots of transistors there. Okay, back to the important stuff. If we combine transistors together, we can use them to store more complex data. For example, if we have four transistors, we can store up to 16 different pieces of data or two to the fourth power. So when we say a computer has some amount of memory, say eight gigabytes of memory, what we really mean is that there are 64 billion transistors being used to store that memory. But now computers don't just store information. As the name suggests, they also compute information. And to do this, we actually still just use a bunch of transistors. Specifically, we use what are called Boolean logic gates. Essentially, these just take in some binary inputs and they can create some different binary output. Some of the most basic of these are AND and OR gates. And then if we combine enough of the gates together, we can actually create more complex circuits for things like addition. And that brings us to computer programming. Computers come pre-built with a bunch of these different circuits, as well as they come with what we call an assembly language, which is a very low level programming language that allows us to do things like addition using the addition circuit. It also allows us to read, write, and update to our RAM or random access memory, which is that 64 billion transistors we talked about earlier. But assembly isn't all that practical, so that's all I'm going to say on that for now. Of course, you can do more research on your own if you so desire. But instead of assembly, computer scientists have created what we call high-level programming languages. These essentially are programming languages that are easier to write, and then we can automatically convert the code we write into assembly code that the computer can understand. And the program that does this conversion for us is known as a compiler. Modern computers also come with an operating system such as Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. And all an operating system is is a program or a package of programs really that are meant to regulate how other programs can interact with the hardware as well as they just are there to make life a little bit easier on the user. The most important component to the operating system is called the kernel. This is what really controls memory management and a bunch of these low level features of the hardware. Okay, but to start writing code, you'll also need a few tools first. For example, we need to figure out where do we even write the code to begin with. And for this, we have code editors or IDEs, meaning integrated development environments. Think sort of Google Docs or Microsoft Word, but specialized for writing code. The most popular of these, and the one I would usually recommend, is going to be Visual Studio Code. You'll also want to get used to using a terminal. Terminals are desktop applications for interacting with a shell. And a shell is a text-based user interface that we use to interact with a computer. So instead of using a mouse to click on some UI elements, we type into a shell. And this shell can do pretty much anything on your computer. It can open different applications, it can change files, and of course, it can run code. Bash is the most popular of these, and it's pretty easy to get started with. So to begin, type pwd to print your working directory, and then type ls to list all of the files and nested directories in that directory. And then you can use cd to change directories into one of those nested directories. From here, we can see I have a .js file, which is a JavaScript code file. We can run this file using node and then the name of that file, but more on that later. Another tool you'll want to be familiar with is called Git. Git is a version control system for tracking changes to code. Think Google Docs history, but again, specialized for coding. To get started, type git init, which changes your current directory into a repository, which is just a directory being tracked by git. At any point, type git status, which shows you the status of all the files you've changed. And whenever you are ready to commit those changes or save them into history, essentially, type git add and then a dot, which is going to stage all of your changes for commit. 
Alternatively, you can do git add and then specific file paths if you want to only stage some of your changes. From here, type git commit dash m for message and add a message in quotation marks. Make sure to make this actually a meaningful message so that other people can tell what this commit is actually about. And that's it, you've now committed your changes. But if you're working with a team, you might want to share your changes with the team. And for that, you need a Git hosting service such as GitHub. This essentially just puts your Git repository online so that multiple people can use it. So what you are going to do is create the repository on GitHub, type git push to send your new commit onto GitHub, and then your teammates can type git pull to download the changes that you just made. Okay, so now on to actual programming. And first, we need to choose a programming language. So if you're working on something that needs to be incredibly performant, think things like operating systems or incredibly intensive games, you want to use a pretty low-level programming language. Low-level languages are languages with a minimal abstraction away from assembly. So these are languages that give you extra control over things like memory management. And because of this, you can usually optimize your code more and make it much more performant. But there's a trade-off here, and that's that low-level languages tend to be harder to work with so generally, I would avoid them unless you actually need to be using them. Some of the most popular low-level languages are C, C++, and more recently, Rust. As a quick aside, it is worth noting that the term low-level languages has been changing a lot over time. Back in the 1970s, when C came out, it was considered a high-level language because of its abstraction away from assembly. But in more modern times, we sort of have changed this definition, so do know you might see it be used in different ways, you are welcome to fight me about my definition down in the comments below if you care to. On the other hand, we have high-level languages. High-level languages have more abstraction away from assembly, and thus they tend to be easier to use, but the trade-off is we lose control over things like memory management, and thus we can't optimize our code quite as much. Some of the most popular of these are going to be Python and JavaScript. It's also worth noting that there are some languages that have to be used for certain types of applications. For example, if you want to make a website, you pretty much have to use JavaScript because it's the only language that browsers widely support. Okay, so for this video, I'm going to use JavaScript because it's probably the most widely used language and thus the most practical, but do know that most languages are more similar to each other than they are different, so it doesn't really matter which one you choose to use. To get started, create a new file ending in .js. Use the let keyword to create a variable, and then we can give it a name such as age. And then we use the assignment operator to give it a value, which is going to be the equal sign. So we say let age equal, and then we can say, for example, 24. Most languages are going to use semicolons to end a statement similar to a period at the end of a sentence. So I will add a semicolon here, but do know they are actually optional in JavaScript and there are some languages that don't have them at all. There are a variety of different types of data that we can use in JavaScript and pretty much any programming language. So for example, 24 is a number, but we could also say let name equal Connor and Connor is going to be a string which we denote using quotation marks. To print out a value, type console.log and then put the value in parentheses. We can then run this code using that node command we saw earlier to actually see our value that we printed out. Objects are just a collection of related data and methods. So for example, I can create a person object using curly brace syntax because that's how we do it in JavaScript. And then we use key value pairs to be the actual properties of the object. Functions are just reusable pieces of code. For example, this function takes in a person and prints out their name and their age. If a function is on an object, that function is then called a method. If a function uses the return keyword, it will return a value up to wherever the function was invoked from. Arrays are just lists of data, and typically these are stored in contiguous blocks of memory in somewhere called the heap. And this heap is also where we store all of our objects. And this is that whole thing about low-level languages being more performant than high-level languages. One of the reasons for this is that low-level languages give you direct control over allocating and freeing up space on the heap, whereas high-level languages don't, and instead they just use a garbage collector to do it automatically. And because of this, when you write programs in high-level languages, you don't even really need to think about the heap at all. Object-oriented programming is a programming paradigm that focuses on objects. And with object-oriented programming, we usually use classes. Classes are blueprints for creating objects. So for example, we can have a person class, and that person class can be used to instantiate multiple people objects. Control flow statements are ways to control the order of execution of code. The most basic of these is going to be an if statement. So we can say if and then some condition, and if the condition is true, we run this code between the curly braces. We can also chain these together using else if and eventually else. 
So else if is going to work just like the if statement, but only run if the if statement before it was false. And then we can at the end have an else block, which is going to be like a default case. Loops are ways to continually keep running the same code over and over again. For example, a while loop is going to run this code until this condition becomes false. A for loop creates some variable and then runs some code until a condition is met, and at the end of each iteration, it is going to increment the variable that was initially created. An infinite loop is a loop that never finishes and thus causes your program to freeze, but don't worry, we all make that mistake from time to time. Recursion occurs when a function calls itself. In essence, this is basically a loop. Infinite recursion occurs when a function calls itself and never finishes, which causes stack overflow because we run out of space for all of the different function calls. Function calls are made on a call stack. The call stack just contains all of the currently executing functions, and each one we execute gets added to the top. So if a function calls another function, that nested function is on top of the main function, and when a function completes, it is popped off of the call stack, and when the call stack is empty, that means there's no code currently running. Sometimes programmers want more complex data structures than the ones that are given to us, and for these we usually just implement them using the built-in arrays and objects. For example, a linked list is just a bunch of objects which we call nodes. Each node has a value as well as a reference to the next node in the list. A tree is like a linked list, but instead of just having one reference, nodes can have multiple references to what we call their children. A graph is just like a tree, but rather than maintaining this top to bottom hierarchy, a graph node can have a reference to any other node in the graph. Stacks are last in, first out. So what this means is whenever any data is added to a stack, it's put on top. And whenever any data is removed from the stack, it is removed from the top. Queues work just like queues in real life. They are first in, first out. So whoever is first in line is the first one to complete the line and get out of the line. Most programming uses computer networks. Computer networks are just sets of computers that are connected to each other in some way so that they can communicate. The most common of these computer networks is of course the internet. When you go to a website on the internet, the website URL is converted into an IP address, which is simply a unique identifier for some computer on the internet. Every website is hosted on a server, and a server is just a remote computer somewhere, and of course that computer has an IP address, which is the IP address we need to get from the URL. If your computer doesn't know an IP address, it uses a DNS lookup, which is essentially like a phone book, but for the internet. Your computer initiates a conversation with the server using what's called a TCP three-way handshake. And then, your computer is going to make an HTTP request to the server requesting the information for the web page it wants to see. This response will contain an HTML file or hypertext markup language, and this is a language used for the contents of a web page. It also might have a CSS file or cascading style sheets, which is going to be a language for the style and layout of a website. Finally, it could also include some JavaScript, which we've already seen, and this allows you to add functionality to the site. One problem with this system is it's very insecure. Data is being sent all over the place between tons of different computers that could intercept your data. So to handle this, we now use HTTPS, with the S standing for secure. This uses TLS, which is basically just a way to encrypt the data as it travels through the internet. You also might need to store some persistent data, such as user account information, which needs a database. And there are tons of types of databases. For example, a SQL or SQL database is probably the most common type of database. This type of database is going to be a relational database, meaning that it's mostly just a bunch of tables and these tables have relations to each other in some way. A NoSQL database, on the other hand, is, well, a database not using SQL. There are tons of types of these with different types of data stores. For example, you could store raw documents, some have key value pairs sort of similar to JavaScript objects, and others just use pretty much any data type you could imagine. So just know that there's tons of them and they all sort of have their own trade-offs. And with all of this data, you probably want to make data-based decisions and for that we have machine learning. Machine learning is the process of teaching a computer how to learn and thus over time it can make better decisions than us dumb humans can. Supervised machine learning is a subset of machine learning where we give a computer a bunch of data and labels for that data and it then can use that past data to label future data on its own. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, is when we give a computer data but without any labels, and it's able to organize or sort of group that data and ultimately help us understand it better. And now, of course, we haven't gone in depth on pretty much anything in this video, but hopefully it gave you a good idea of some of the more practical aspects of computer science that you could go on and learn in the future. And if you are learning about computer science and want to become a software engineer, you'll need to pass some technical interviews, and for that, I would watch this video next.